you're not seeing double. You're just seeing the next big step in aircraft design, or what some more imaginative engineers would have you to believe. The double or twin fuselage plane concept is one that has been tested for well over 70 years with various different successes and failures, but never held mainstream appeal. Why was it never a huge success and could we see a new design right around the corner? Let's find out together in this episode of When it comes to aircraft design, there are three main considerations, capacity, range and speed. Speed is relatively straightforward hurdle to conquer. You strap some bad boy engines to an aircraft, kick it to the max and break some poor farmer's window with a sonic boom. We've had the technology forever and there isn't any roadblocks now, just the appetite from aircraft customers. The other two considerations, range and capacity, are a bigger can of worms. Both of them are intertwined and are the result of aircraft size. A bigger aircraft can logically carry more passengers and cargo, but in turn costs more in fuel to operate. To get around that, the bigger plane has a larger fuel tank, increasing its size and weight and then creating that balanced trade-off. This can lead to some awkward issues where a plane can be so large and have an impressive range, but actually carry less than its internal volume, the exact major flaw of the Airbus A380 cargo variant. But what if there was a way to simultaneously increase the range of capacity without trading off for both? It's not making an aircraft taller, thicker or longer, but rather doubling it. Thus, the twin fuselage concept was born. While there have been many different double fuselage concepts in history, such as the Nazi BF-109Z and the HE-111Z's filling, we wouldn't see the real production rollout of this design until the end of World War II with the North American P-82 twin Mustang. This latter aircraft, the Svilling, would have extra engines in the mid-wing between the two fuselages to give it extra power to pull huge Nazi gliders like the ME-321. But with few gliders built and no aerial invasion upcoming for the Nazi Empire, there wasn't much need for the tug. The original P-51 Mustang had proven itself throughout the conflict, but it had one small issue. Its small fuel tank meant it was not suitable for flights over the vast Pacific Ocean. Engineers at North American realized that the easiest way to fix this was not with a wholly new concept, but simply joining two Mustang fuselages together, doubling the amount of fuel almost instantly. Of course, I need to point out in my narrative here that eventually the engineers started from scratch with this as a new design, but the resemblance to the original Mustang is obvious. This double trouble Mustang would have a longer fuselage than the original by 57 inches, with more fuel tanks behind each cockpit and a new center wing section containing another six M3 Browning machine guns. That's a lot of firepower. There was also a consideration to boost that with a 40 mm cannon, but it never left the drawing board. You'll also notice that at the rear that there was a dorsal fillet between the two tails for stability in case of engine failure. Now you've probably been itching to ask, what about that situation with the two pilots? Which one controlled the plane? The original design had both pilots having full control so they could alternate on long missions allowing the other to rest. But further development made the left the pilot seat and the right a radar operator. The overall carrying capacity was a thousand pounds, allowing for more fuel or bombs over the original design. This capacity would allow it a huge range of 2,240 miles, nearly double the original design. This suited the plane well, as its actual role was to be a very long-range escort fighter for the Boeing B-52 
B-29 Super Fortress for missions with a range over 2,000 miles, and later a bomber interceptor against those pesky Soviets. The aircraft did its first test flight in June 1945, and the US Air Force officers were so darn impressed that they ordered its full production right away. It set several records, such as Hawaii to New York in only 14 hours and 32 minutes non-stop, setting the unbeaten record of the longest non-stop flight ever made by a propeller-driven fighter. The Air Force accepted a total of 272 F-82s, including 22 prototypes, test and early production aircraft, and it would serve proudly in the Korean War until its role was succeeded by the Republic F-84E Thunderjet in the early 1950s. This beautiful aircraft was not only notable for its double fuselage design with a cockpit on each side, but also that it was the last piston-engined fighter jet ordered by the US before switching exclusively to jet fighters. But let me tell you boys and girls, our story of the double fuselage doesn't stop here. One of the hidden advantages of twin fuselages was the ability to burn double the amount of fuel at once for additional power, meaning these concepts could effectively be fantastic at carrying heavy loads. Everything from iron ore to oil to say for example, a space shuttle. In the 1970s, NASA and the USSR were trying to come up with the next launch system to take man to the outer limit. And a certain logic led them to consider putting a shuttle on a vast flying mothership. After all, a conventional plane could fly high in the sky, launch a rocket, and remove the significant chunk of fuel burn to get off from sea level. Plus it would avoid inefficient disposable rocket boosters, remove expensive ground infrastructure, and would make launch schedules a whole lot more flexible. Boeing and Lockheed were both selected to come up with designs for the concept under a NASA plan. It was to save money on developing a new aircraft from scratch by making it out of existing aircraft parts on the market. Boeing would propose the Boeing 747 as its shuttle launcher and Lockheed with its C-5 Galaxy design. The issue is, these concepts were so huge, requiring whole airports to be built and expensive in terms of research and development, that it was more simple for NASA to just launch the rockets from its existing launch sites. But if you've been around aviation for a while, then you know that the Russians had their own insane twin fuselage concept, the twin AN-225. However, this project, along with an even crazier concept, the Monia 1000 Heracles, probably deserve their own videos, so stay tuned for them in the future. But that being said, the idea of rocket launches wasn't completely thrown out of the window. In the middle of the Mojave Desert in 2019, the scale composite of its Model 351 Strato launch took to the skies. With twin fuselages 73 meters long, 28 wheels, and a wingspan of 385 feet, it's the widest plane flying today. On its right, there is a crew deck for three, and the other fuselage allows up to 2,500 pounds of cargo for specific rocket launch missions, being able to launch up to three at once. Tested twice, this insane aircraft will be launching rockets soon from 2022, and perhaps even manned aircraft from 2023. This aircraft joins the other scale composite dual fuselage aircraft, such as the White Knight 2 that operates for Virgin Galactic on a similar mission, although at a much more reasonable scale. So what of passenger designs? Concepts have been built before World War II back into the 1930s, such as the Savoia Machete S55 and S66, but it would be a decent amount of time until the capacity problems of the modern aviation world would lead us to twin fuselage plans being drawn up. There was a brief branch into double low passenger designs, but these were really two fuselages cut in half and then pasted together to increase passenger capacity. Whilst it's technically a double fuselage, it kind of takes away from the spirit of this video, so I suggest you actually check out this other video I did of the Airbus A320. 
380 development. Speaking of Airbus, however, in 2008 they actually patented a twin fuselage design. It shows the fuselages connected by way of two forward swept wings with the front wing position lower than the rear upper wing. The engines would have been located near the end of the plane. Believe it or not, this patent is very similar to one by Boeing that featured twin Boeing 737 fuselages with twin engines in the middle. Obviously the jury is still out if either Boeing or Airbus will take actions on the respective patents, but one can hope. There have also been other inklings of designs from Northrop Grumman of a future passenger aircraft, with twin engines between the two fuselages, which actually looks quite nice. But apart from these concepts, it looks like we might be stuck with our boring single fuselage planes for a while longer. Littered throughout history, there are many other concepts that deserve their own videos. NASA's studies into the twin fuselage concept led them down a road of not only double concepts, but triple fuselage concepts as well, with a 427 foot wing and being able to carry up to 900 passengers in each body. But of course, I'm gonna leave you at this. At the start of the video, I said that there was always a trade-off between speed, capacity, and range. Well, it turns out that I lied, because there is one more design of a double American Concorde, which I think you'll agree is the ultimate twin fuselage plane. If you love aviation, then I suggest you check out the social media channels for Found and Explained. We've got everything from Facebook to Instagram to TikTok and a Discord channel where you can come on and chat to other fans of the channel. And if you want to become a super fan, then we also have channel memberships and Patreon. By signing up, you get to suggest future topics, chat with me direct, and also see videos early, which is pretty damn cool because it means you get to put first at the bottom of this video. Thanks so much for watching. In World War II, Lockheed developed a new type of fighter plane that could fly double the speed of any other aircraft. It had missions that could scout out enemy positions from high altitude, and it could even shoot down bombers long before they became a threat all thanks to a new technology called jet engines. This would have been incredible, bringing forward the jet age years in advance and might have even changed the outcome of the war. But this was so futuristic that even the US military was afraid of it and cancelled its production. Meet the incredible, before its time, Lockheed L-133 Starjet. The year is 1939. Rising tensions in Europe and an expanding Japanese empire have put the world on notice. These events overshadowed another critical new invention, the creation of the first jet engines. Lockheed engineers were excited by this new development and began several paper projects to create a plane that could fly on jet power, and by the following year had come up with a engine to power it, the L-1000. Now I can't stress that this engine was truly ahead of its time. It used a concept called a axial flow type engine that could provide a five and a half a thousand pounds of thrust while only weighing just over a thousand pounds. It would be a nearly a decade later when the British would come out with their own centrifugal flow engine design that was inferior. The L-1000 would be the pinnacle of Lockheed technology and in fact jet technology worldwide at the time and usher in a new age of jet transportation as well as the obvious military applications. In fact, it's these military applications and the rising tensions with Japan and Nazi Germany that made the US Army very interested. They would authorize the construction of a prototype engine right away. And this presented the first challenge for our Lockheed engineers because they didn't actually have a plane to put the engine in. Enter our hero of the story. In effect, to prove that this engine was the future of aviation, Lockheed would need to build the first American jet aircraft to house this powerful new technology. 
It would be utterly futuristic and be unlike any other aircraft that had come before, looking more like something out of Buck Rogers than any plane flying in the world. It would have the inspiring name of the L1330201 and it would have a top speed of 612 miles per hour to a range of 310 miles. Now that range is pretty small, but remember back then jet engines were very inefficient. Using the P-38 Lightning as a base, the engineers first gave it a conventional mid-wing layout with prone seated pilot to eliminate the bubble cockpit and have better aerodynamics. But this would cause all sorts of issues with the guns, which I'll get to in a moment, and thus a different design would be needed. Next, they came up with the rear wing design, placing the engines at the back of the plane and giving the pilot more of a conventional cockpit. But the engine intakes on the side of the pilot wouldn't give it enough oxygen into the jet engine to get it up to the required speed. Thus, the final design would have the air intake move to the nose of the plane. A normal cockpit, a blended wing body with the same wings at the rear of the plane. Its wheels would also be powered and allow it to coast up to some serious speed on the runway to aid with takeoff. The D-shaped air ducts would move from the front of the plane around the cockpit to the twin engines at the back. Because the air intake was on the nose, the weapons would actually be mounted inside of it, particularly four 20mm cannons providing enough firepower to take out those enemy bombers. Now, this is where very early jet aircraft design is a little bit flawed, and it's only thanks to 70 years of hindsight that we can actually be critical. In an interview with one of the designer's children back in 2013, they admitted that their father had no clue where the guns would actually be in the production model. Whilst it was very novel to have the guns actually inside of the forward air intake, practically this was a very dumb idea. Gases and other spent fragments from the shells would be sucked right into the jet engine and you thought a bird strike would be bad. Plus, if the air intake was at the front of the plane, where exactly would the ammo for these guns go? The landing gear? An eventual radar dome? Room was already at a premium and this air intake was causing all sorts of problems. There was also the matter of range. Whilst the production model would have pushed that beyond several hundred miles, it was unlikely to be a very practical fighter for extensive use across the sea to battle Japan. So already practically this jet didn't make a ton of sense. But being the happy naive engineers back then in the 1940s, Lockheed took the concept to the government to be built. And the answer from those in Washington? Stop this nonsense and build more propeller planes. Let me explain. Now at first glance, this seems like a totally insane idea from the government. Here Lockheed had made an aircraft that on paper proved to have clear advantages over anything the Nazis or the Japanese had in the field in 1942. But these generals did have some legitimate concerns. The first was that jet engines were clearly an untested, unproven and undeveloped technology. It could have been a few more months, years or even decades to get it to work properly and to bet the farm on something that might not work wasn't a high priority. Especially considering that they already had fleets of propeller aircraft doing the right job. In fact, this project management of the engine, the L1000, was shocking. Due to wartime production, precision parts were hard to come by and the research stalled to a crawl. They simply didn't have the materials, expertise, nor the capability to make this at the time. They were a decade too early. Additionally, fighter pilots at the time, as well as the crew, maintenance and the entire US war machine were trained on propeller aircraft. To introduce a new type of plane during a war would have been very difficult and again sucked away essential war resources. But it's the last point that was the most interesting. There was simply 
no need for this jet. At the time, enemy bombers and fighter planes flew around 10,000 feet at half the speed, so why would they need something so ridiculously overpowered? Ironically, they would encounter the Nazi Mi-262 only a few short years later, and development of the British jet engines put an egg on the US's face, making them scramble to come up with their own jet aircraft at the end of the decade. Ironically, much of the P-80 was based on the original design work of the L-133, and even shared part of the name, the Shooting Star. So, go figure. As for the original engine, the L-1000 was outsourced from Lockheed, who needed to focus on plane building, and wouldn't actually be built until the end of the 1940s. It was simply too late, the war was over, and history had passed it by. Now, I do have to wonder here, what if this aircraft had actually gone into production? The ramifications would have been huge, but like the Mi-262, perhaps it would have not have been made in large enough numbers to make a significant difference. But in the few battles that it would have been used, it would have absolutely guaranteed air superiority for the Allies, able to fly faster than any enemy aircraft that they could muster. Although it's the real alternative history ramifications that would have been the most interesting. For sure, Lockheed would have developed a faster bomber using this technology and in turn, jet commercial aircraft 10 years earlier than we had it today. Meaning we might be all flying around on board a Lockheed A300 Dreamliner instead. Wait, didn't Lockheed just develop a new tanker aircraft? <laughs> But maybe that's a video for another day. Thanks for watching. Flying high over Germany, the unique jet powered Mi 262 rules the sky. That is, until now. Thundering from out of the sun comes a squadron of Yankees powered by jet fuel. Newly arrived to the continent, this innovative American made aircraft would level the playing field against Hitler's supersonic armada. But this story never happened. The Americans would never really enter a jet fighter into the Second World War, despite having the technology years before. While an attempt had actually been made on paper by Lockheed, it was this second attempt that actually got built, but ultimately never saw action. Join me to witness the discovery of the jet engine and the Bell P-59 Aero Comet. Like many aerospace innovations, it was actually the Germans that got there first. In 1939, the Germans shocked the world with a totally radical new aircraft, one that was powered by thrust provided by a turbojet engine. There were no pistons, no propellers, and for Germany, it was the clear future of aerospace. This jet aircraft in particular was called the Heinkel He-178, and on the 27th of August 1939, the aircraft performed its maiden flight only days before Germany invaded Poland. The development of this engine was only thanks to the Allies from the previous war. Due to the restrictions placed on Germany by France, England and the United States at the Treaty of Versailles, Germany was forbidden to develop any new piston aircraft. The issue was, Jet engines weren't pistons, and being the savvy legalese Europeans that the Germans are, they came up with an entirely new type of plane. This development quickly woke up the Italians and the British, who got to work developing their own jet engine aircraft. But with the introduction of a sequel to the Great War in 1939, essential resources were diverted away from these operations to more tried and true technologies, like piston planes. It was the British who had a breakthrough though with a jet-powered aircraft as early as 1941, called the Gloucester E-28-39. It was during this taxi test of the aircraft that our hero of the story happened to be in the crowd. Major General Henry H. Hap Arnold, who took notice and knew that the Americans just had to have it. Returning back to the States with blueprints of the British jet engine in hand and a copy being transferred on a top secret flight, it was time for America to have a go. But of course, he would have to keep it all top secret. 
Upon arriving back in Washington, Henry Arnold got to work contacting the best of the best, top men. Top men. Discreetly and using spy tactics that would make James Bond blush. First for the engine, he delivered it to the hands of General Electric to replicate and perhaps even improve on the British design. But an engine isn't worth diddly squat without a plane to fly it, so he turned to his friends at Bell to come up with a suitable fuselage. To keep it all hush hush, he actually filed the program under the Bell XP-59, a discontinued fighter project that got cancelled a few years before. To any spies hunting around, this plane would seem like a crazy general's passion project who just wouldn't let it go. But he didn't stop there. To take the secrecy to the next level, the Bell engineers decided to rent out a loft above a car factory and not use their main plant. Chosen not only for the space, but also because any fabricated parts for this new plane would look just like car materials. They even made a propeller for the plane to stick on front, so if anybody stumbled upon the workshop or the plane sitting out in a field, they would assume that the Major General really was nutty in building his own little plane project. After about a year of work on the first prototype, it was ready, and they had to get it to an airfield to test it. Ironically, because planes are bigger than cars, it wouldn't fit in the elevator, so under the cover of darkness on the 12th of September in 1942, they broke down the real wall of the building, spreading bricks everywhere, and towed it to a nearby rail yard. It was shipped discreetly in the early hours to Murdoch Army Airfield, now famously known as Edwards Air Force Base, where on the 2nd of October, it took to the skies for the first time. Impressed by the progress made by the Bell engineers in just over a year, the Major General expedited another 13 prototypes to get through the test phase and get the jet into the hands of ace pilots as quickly as possible. But that's where things started to go wrong. Testing a new aircraft, let alone one powered by a new type of propulsion, is no easy feat. But the Bell P-59's design was very unique and new to the market. The P-59A aircraft featured an all-metal stress skin in a semi-monocoque fuselage with an oval cross-section that contained a single pressurized cockpit. Its mid-mounted wing was straight and equipped with two spars and a false spar in the inner panel, while the landing gear was that typical tricycle style of the era and electronically powered, attached to the central spar. Under the wing roots were streamlined nacelles that housed a pair of General Electric J31 turbojets, the General Electric take on the British design. This would give it a top speed of around 413 miles per hour, or 665 kilometers per hour, at around 30,000 feet. You'll notice that this is hardly close to some of the Nazi designs that boasted a speed of over 1,000 kilometers per hour, but we'll get to that in a moment. The nose of the aircraft contained its impressive armament. Two of the three XP-59As and most of the YP-59As had a pair of 37mm M10 auto cannons, while later models, including the production design, had one M10 auto cannon and three 0.5 inch Browning heavy machine guns, perfect for air-to-air -air dogfights. The fuel system consisted of four self-sealing tanks which held a total of 290 US gallons, or just over a thousand litres, and both production models were capable of carrying drop tanks under the wings with an extra capacity of 1,590 US gallons, or around 6,000 litres. That gave it a range of 375 miles, although that's just in combat. Moving at a slower speed, they could extend that out to around a thousand miles or so. This design won hearts and minds in Washington, and an initial order of 100 jets was made to Bell. But by March 1943, security concerns over spy rings finding out about the project had it moved to a very remote location, where extensive testing was carried out, and the aircraft was found lacking. During diving trials in 1944, one prototype was forced to make a belly landing and another crashed when its entire epinage broke away. But this only revealed more flaws with the design. 
After conducting tests on the prototypes and pre-production P59s over the next few months, numerous issues were discovered. These included unreliable and poorly responsive engines, very typical of early turbojets, instability during high-speed flights over 290 miles per hour, which caused the plane to snake in the sky, and ineffective gunnery capabilities. It turns out that that armament wasn't so impressive. Additionally, the engines produced insufficient thrust, failing to meet expectations and significantly hampering performance. Plus, they had to constantly be repaired even if they got a little wet, something that they didn't discover when they were training out in the desert. Because of this, the initial order of 100 jets was reduced to only 50. This is all very bad news for the American jet fighter supposed to go toe-to-toe -to -toe against the Mi-262. Although I do need to point out, in this timeline of events, the Mi-262 had not yet entered full operations in the European theatre. But this new technology had shown so much promise. How could Washington determine if the project should still go ahead? With a good old showdown, of course. In February of 1944, the Army Air Force pitted the jet against propeller-driven fighters such as the Lockheed P-38J Lightning and the Republic P-47D Thunderbolt in combat trials, and the older planes outperformed the jet. Consequently, and because the Army Air Force already had 50 production units on the way, the decision was made that the P-59 was best suited for training purposes. Providing pilots with experience operating jet engine aircraft before even more powerful ones could be delivered. But a footnote to this story is that the Major General came back and actually returned the jet to the British to show them what they had done. And it would be a fair criticism to say that His Majesty's best pilots found it lacking. Far inferior to the current jet aircraft that they had at the time, the Gloucester Media One. The Army Air Force also tried to spin off this dud plane to the Navy, in typical rival fashion, sending two prototypes to the Pacific, but it was found to be terrible for carrier operations. It seemed that the second attempt by the United States would ultimately not pan out. But you know that famous saying, third time's the charm. Now that's an awesome tale for the next Found and Explained video. Thanks for watching. Don't adjust your phone screen, there's nothing wrong with the plane you are witnessing. It's just very flat. This, my esteemed viewers, is none other than the Vought Flying Pancake, an aircraft made for one very simple mission, to fly as humanely slow as possible and take off from the smallest runway ever conceived, less than 200 feet. In a world without VTOL aircraft, this cutting-edge design might have changed the way we fly and the way World War II was won. Let's jump into one of the strangest aircraft to ever grace the skies. High speed is not everything in aviation. Sometimes the need is for something other than having an aircraft that travels very fast. Speed might be sacrificed so that the plane can carry more cargo or payloads, or if an aircraft needs to fly longer distances more economically. Another reason why lower speed may be preferable is for when an aircraft needs to fly low and slow. The latter reason for a low-speed military aircraft concept was the primary driving force behind the aircraft that we'll be covering in this video. The Vought V173 was designed not only to fly at a low speed, but at a snail's pace. And the thinking behind its design by one of the most innovative aircraft designers of the time was for a wing design with an extremely low aspect ratio. That design ethos created an aircraft that was as flat as it was roundish in shape. The result was what many thought looked like a giant flapjack or a pancake flying through the sky, hence the quirky name, the Flying Pancake. So what went into making the Vought V173 or Flying Pancake? 
The 173 was an aircraft built during World War II. As already mentioned, central to the proof of concept for this craft was an extremely low aspect ratio wing design. This created an aircraft that was essentially one giant, flat-shaped wing, hence its pancake-like appearance. Its most eye-catching and unique feature was its circular wing, which was relatively small at 23.3 feet or 7.1 meters in diameter. This small wing area was meant to provide structural strength and allow the craft to have a high level of maneuverability at low speeds. This design was actually created by the NACA, which was the precursor to NASA and stood for the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. This essential result was a mathematically precise form of soft camber lid contouring. In theory, this type of airfoil allowed for a constant, unaltered airflow over the surface, allowing the plane to fly slower with more control. A huge three-bladed wooden propeller was to be mounted at the tip of each foil on each side. These twin giant propellers would ensure that the entire aircraft was covered in a constant slipstream of air, thereby maximizing its aerodynamic performance in conjunction with the NACA airfoil. These prop rotors were powered by a pair of air-cooled Continental A80 radial engines capable of a very modest 80 horsepower. Yeah, that's pretty low, but we'll get to that in a moment. The two four-cylinder piston engines would be housed within a fuselage on either side of the cockpit and just above the landing struts, with the wing, which was effectively also the fuselage, had a complex structure that consisted of two horizontal stabilizers, two rudders, and two large elevators right at the midpoint of the fuselage. Once again, this was all designed in order to achieve maximum aerodynamic lift and flow. This high angle off the ground meant that clearance was provided for the large propellers. It also enabled a short takeoff as lift could be quickly generated due to the high angle of the wing area in relation to the prevailing airflow. As such, a big plus of the V173 was its ability to take off within 200 feet, as which would be essential aboard most ships with limited runway space. Another plus was that it could also take off vertically into a 25 not wind. So not technically a VTOL, but on some days it definitely acted like one. Due to its round flat design, the V173 had a tall undercarriage that gave it a ground angle of 22 degrees, meaning that the pilot could actually enter the cockpit via a portable ladder underneath the fuselage. But this high angle also meant that the forward visibility was almost non-existent until the craft fully lifted from the runway, which you can imagine was a problem on the short stubby decks of an aircraft carrier. And who was the man behind this unique, even revolutionary plane design that was so heavily dependent on precise aerodynamic principles? Wow, none other than Charles H. Zinnemann. Charles Zinnemann is central to the entire story of the Vought V-173. Kansas-born Zinnemann was an aeronautical engineer who made a career out of researching aircraft stability and loads, as well as, critically for the Vought 173, the design of the airfoils. Zinnemann was obsessed with the idea of what were dubbed as discordial or disc-shaped aircraft. He was convinced that having a disc-shaped aircraft with a wing design with an extremely low aspect ratio would allow it to fly at very low speeds. Zinnemann had commenced with this research into the concept in 1933 and eventually filed a design patent in 1935, granted by February 14th, 1938. However, the agency behind him, the NACA, decided it wasn't prepared to invest in the crazy design, so Zinnemann thought that it would be best to venture into the private sector to pursue it further with full blessing from the NACA. It was this exact pitch that won him the chance to build a prototype with Chance Vought, pun not intended, a respectable manufacturer that dated way back to 1917 and which by early 1940s was an independent division of the United Aircraft and Transport Corporation of America. 
It was actually rather ironic because Chance Fort had always been pretty conservative during this era, yet the division decided to invest heavily into Zinnemann's unique concept. Vought had been awarded a contract by the United States Navy in May 1940 to build this slow plane for carrier operations. By early 1942, the United States was actively involved in World War II, and so the Navy demanded that the plane be able to do very short distance takeoffs from tankers, capital ships, and the decks of aircraft carriers in order to counter the threat posed by Japanese aircraft in the Pacific War arena. And you've got to remember that the United States had just been attacked by the Japanese at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii, so they were definitely looking for a way to counter the threat of this new Asian menace. The Pressure was certainly on Zinnemann and his team to deliver on this radical, new, slow plane concept. Although commissioned in 1940, and even with all the immense pressure being applied by the US Navy, the first test flight of the Vought 173 was only by November 1942. The prototype weighed in at 2,000 pounds, or, or just over a metric ton, with a length of 26.8 feet or 8.1 meters. But boy was this thing slow. The flying pancake could only achieve a maximum speed of 138 miles or 222 kilometers per hour. Its rate of climb was somewhat cumbersome at 5,000 feet in seven minutes. The plane was clearly neither fast or high flying, but it was nimble in its takeoff and landing capabilities, and that was already at the height of advantage at World War II. Early tests were done by Vought's chance own respected test pilots, Booney Guyton and Richard Burroughs. Guyton had been the first to test it in November 1942 and found it generally responsive as an aircraft, even when encountering difficulties with stability during landing, for example. But that was only the tip of the iceberg with the aircraft. In particular, the aircraft was found to have an overly complicated gearbox that had the habit of routing power from the engines to its two long propeller shafts, creating unbearable amounts of vibration. Guyton, the inaugural test pilot, also found that the cockpit design was very poor and very uncomfortable. It also provided the pilot with limited to no use for the bottom panels of the cockpit since the pilot was positioned too high to make a comfortable or safety use for them for takeoff or landing. So these pilots were hot, vibrating, and were as blind as a bat. Another test pilot of the plane was none other than the legendary transatlantic aviator, an American icon, Charles Lindbergh, who conducted a couple of test flights. Testing found the V-173 could almost hover and had the ability to overcome forced landings, which included a nose-over crash during one test. In fact, that rollover occurred on a forced landing on a beach due to the pilot wanting to avoid two sunbathers lying on said sand. Even then, the airframe was so strong that the plane didn't sustain any significant damage and the pilot came out unscathed. With testing complete with the prototype, the US Navy decided to move forward with a more robust version called the Vought XF5U1. This production model got the famous nickname of the Flying Flapjack. It would feature an all-metal construction, making it five times heavier with new powerful engines to boot. This new power would mean less vibrations and more weight carrying capacity to install weapons, such as a combination of six M2 Browning 50 caliber machine guns, four M3 20 millimeter cannons, or two 1,000 or 450 kilogram bombs. Although obviously not all at the same time. Other flaws such as the pilot's visibility would be amended. The engines would also fix the problem of its slow speed, allowing the plane to reach up to 452 miles per hour or 727 kilometers per hour. They would also be able to shift their center of lift up and down to help the aircraft get into the sky even faster, not unlike a helicopter rotor. Thankfully, this version also had an ejection seat installed to allow the pilot to escape those long, sharp rotors. The prototype was constructed and did a very brief period of testing on the runway, but never, apart from a few hops, got into the sky. The vibration was still a major problem and there were concerns that it could never be solved. Alas, at that very same airport, there was also a new type of fighter plane being tested. One with an engine that was so powerful, it would get a new nickname, the jet engine. 
The flying pancake would never enter mass production for the Second World War, as was the original intent. However, to its credit, the one full-size flying pancake prototype did go on to have a total of 190 test flights with 131 hours of flight time between 1942 and early 1947 without any major incidences or any injuries to test pilots. That's a damn sight better statistics than even the most experimental prototype aircrafts. Even though it was never fully realized, the outcome of the Flying Pancake project would no doubt be considered satisfactory. Its unique flying characteristics were tried and proven. However, the rapid advancements in jet engine technology at the aftermath of World War II would result in the cancellation of the Vought 173 project by 1947, with the last test flight on March 31st of that year. Propeller-operated experimental aircraft simply weren't required as the Cold War ramped up and the focus became on fast turbojet technology. The all-metal production model, the XF-5U, was destroyed and they had to use a wrecking ball as hand tools were unable to break it down. Credit to the original engineers of the time. As for the original V173 prototype, it would be acquired by the Smithsonian Museum in 1960, finally getting the restoration that it deserved by the Volunteer Vought Aircraft Heritage Foundation many years later, a process completed in 2012. Today, you can find it at the Frontiers of Flight Museum in Dallas, Texas. There are two fascinating bits of trivia about the Vought V173 that I would love to just say. That Charles Lindbergh did test the plane and he found it to be very responsive and a great plane to fly. The second piece of trivia is probably not at all surprising. It's believed that the Flying Pancake was also responsible for several UFO sightings by the general public throughout the 1940s. Imagine a flying disc-shaped aircraft in the sky being confused with a UFO. And it even leads us to wonder if the reason why Zinnemann was so obsessed with circular disc-shaped aircraft that could fly slow or even hover was perhaps he had some unworldly inspiration. Rising above the battlefield in World War II is the bomber aircraft of the future. Carrying 20 machine guns and 52,000 pounds of explosives, this impenetrable flying fortress was more efficient than strategic bombers of the day, cheaper to build, and could even run sorties from the American mainland. But the Flying Wing project would be shrouded in controversy, criticized as a leap too far, forsaken by the government, and perhaps even sabotaged by spies. This is the incredible story of the Northrop XB-35 Flying Wing. The XB-35 Flying Wing could have only existed thanks to one man, Jack Northrop, a brilliant engineer who realized that aircraft design had gone in the wrong direction. The sole purpose of a plane is to fly and thus all these extra areas like fuselage, tail and more don't really contribute to its main objective of generating lift. So why not make a plane that was just the wing? In 1941, in the troubled beginnings of World War II, Northrop was commissioned to come up with a new 10,000 by 10,000 long-range bomber, one that could carry 10,000 pounds of bombs to a range of 10,000 miles. These figures were not arbitrary, but actually proposed just in case that the USA found itself in a cross-Atlantic war by themselves with Nazi Germany. The bombers needed to be able to fly an entire sortie without landing near or in Europe. To reach the range, he advocated his insane flying wing design in an effort to eliminate the parasitic drag and remove unnecessary structural weight. In theory, this design could not only fly further than traditional means, but carry more bombs and cost the taxpayer less. A triple win. This won him a prototype award, and he could work on making his flying wing dream a reality. He would be going up against the very best in the industry, 
Boeing and Convair, whom were tinkering with their own B-36 design. His prototype not only had to win the soon-to-be war, but also beat the brightest minds in the industry. The stakes were high, and this is what they came up with. The XB-35 flying wing would have a total wing of 53 feet and a wingspan of 172 feet. As the whole aircraft was the wing, it would have a huge wing area of 4,000 square feet, roughly 370 meters squared, giving it an aspect ratio of 7 to 4, nearly the same wing area as a Boeing 777-300 today, a plane that easily dwarfs this aircraft in size. The aircraft also had an impressively small radar cross-section that would be very useful for stealth operations, which I'll get to later. Inside, it had a very much traditional cabin that you would find on a normal plane, including a tail cone protruding from the back with a little window, despite the flying wing design not actually having a tail. This would act as a remote sighting station and a viewpoint for the tail gunner. In the middle of the cabin, there was a crew rest area with bunk beds for the long missions, and the wings would house six small bomb bays, three in each wing with rollaway doors. The blueprints also mentioned that the aircraft had big enough bomb bays to carry certain bigger bombs, say those from Project Manhattan, that were currently under development without modification. For the mission, the aircraft would have a crew of nine personnel, a pilot captain, a co-pilot, a bombardier, a navigator, an engineer, a radio operator, and of course, three gunners to operate the 20 machine guns located in six nests around the fuselage, including a single tail stinger position. Speaking of armament, this bomber aircraft could also carry up to 52,000 pounds of bombs or 23,000 kilos of explosives. With four pusher propellers 15 feet across, four and a half meters wide, the aircraft would have a cruise speed of 240 miles per hour, which is around 390 kilometers per hour, and a range of 12,000 kilometers or six and a half thousand nautical miles on a single fuel tank. It had a goal cruise altitude of 39,000 feet or 12,000 meters, but that was actually restricted to 20,000 feet due to APU problems, which I'll get to in a moment. Things were looking up and 200 bombers were ordered by the Air Force with the first to enter the war in 1944. But with such concept aircraft, sometimes things don't exactly go according to plan. The design took so long that the war came and went, and when it finally took to the skies in 1946, it was perceived to be a little bit more antiquated than some of the jet aircraft that the Air Force had seen deployed by the Germans at the end of the war. Whilst its initial test flights were without incident, it turns out that the propellers on the plane hadn't actually been investigated to see if they worked with the engines on board. The highly efficient contra-rotating propellers began to vibrate loose from the Pratt & Whitney engines, causing frustration for the engineers. As it turns out, these engines and propellers had been selected and provided to Northrop by the Air Force without testing or even securing a guarantee that they would work, as if someone had made a backroom deal. Worse still, nobody would take responsibility for the mistake, and no one would cough up the extra funding to replace these engines. Conversations got heated, and needless to say, I'm sure a lot of people said things that they didn't mean. In the end, the engineers were forced to adopt a single rotating propeller on each engine, slowing the plane down. Because the relations had soured between the Air Force and Northrop, the Air Force refused to give them a specific AC electrical alternator for the onboard electrical systems. Thus, the plane had to use its own onboard auxiliary power unit, limiting its ability to fly higher than 15,000 feet or 4,500 meters, which is pretty low for a strategic bomber. Lastly, in an effort to put Northrop in a hard place, the Air Force demanded that the aircraft be able to carry new and bigger atomic bombs under design, otherwise they wouldn't buy it. 
However, it required a small modification on the part of Northrop, a modification that the Air Force refused to allow. A solution to all these problems appeared with the arrival of the jet engine. Why not stick on some jet engines onto the plane to make it a lot faster, and thus no one had to take blame for the electrical or engine problems. It would also require a slight redesign of the fuselage, and Northrop would be able to slip in bigger bomb bays for those atomic bombs. Again, another triple win. But things didn't exactly go as planned. This new version of the plane, now dubbed the YB-49, would fly much faster and higher than the original, especially with its power supply problems. Initial tests in 1948 with eight jet engines allowed the airframe to reach 40,000 feet, 12,000 meters, and topped out at 520 miles per hour or 840 kilometers per hour a very impressive performance. However, the range was greatly reduced and no longer could the plane fill in the role of a grand strategic bomber, a mission profile that had now switched to hitting Russian factories in the USSR. Still, 13 YB-49s managed to get ordered by the Air Force as nothing would be comparably available until well into the mid-1950s. But alas, it seems like that bad luck would follow the project. Of the 13 orders, one crashed in 1948 during stall tests, killing two famous test pilots, Major Daniel Forbes of Forbes Air Force Base fame and Captain Glenn Edwards of Edwards Air Force Base, as well as three other crew members. During a follow-up test flight for then-President Truman in Washington, four of the jet engines seized up due to a lack of oil, revealing that the oil had not been replaced at its last maintenance stop. Odd that such a critical step had been missed by the ground engineers. The last operational prototype was then destroyed in a freak landing gear accident in 1950 during an unusual taxi test. The plane had had its fuel tank filled to the brim and was racing around the ground when the front wheel encountered unusual severe vibrations and collapsed. This rupture caused a small fire which then engulfed and destroyed the entire airframe. Why was the fuel tank full when the plane wasn't even flying that day? Very odd indeed. The other 11 uncompleted prototypes were converted to other prototypes of other designs, such as a spy version called the YRB-49A. It had extra fuel tanks on the wings to get around the pesky range problem and seemingly was the perfect aircraft design. It had fixed all the faults of the previous versions and was winning some support in the Air Force ranks. However, pretty quickly the order for 30 was cancelled without explanation from senior officials. As different people got promoted or moved around, the project landed on the desk of those unfamiliar with the drama and questioned all the back and forth with Air Force Command, as well as crash tests and odd problems. Was this plane really worth all this effort? And then in stepped our good friends at Boeing and Convair, who said, Guys, guys, the solution to your long-range problem is right here, the B-36. That's right, the flying wing was still going up against the Convair B-36 pacemaker. P pace? Peace? Peacemaker? Peacemaker. Boy, good thing I didn't leave out that E from the script, that sure would have been embarrassing. Anyway, this more traditional competitor was seen as a safer alternative that worked and was heavily lobbied by Convair in Washington. Having to choose between the two, the government ended up grounding the Flying Wing program. The last Flying Wing prototype would end up in Ontario Airport, sitting by the runway weathering for two years, until finally being scrapped in December 1953. The Smithsonian, a large museum in the United States, actually asked for this final prototype to be preserved as part of a focus on Northrop, but was declined by the current Air Force Secretary, Stuart Symington. 
Near the very end of the program, Northrop had also been working on a new engine design themselves to finally make the flying wing work. But what seems to be the final insult, all the Northrop data, patents, and even the Turbodyne engine name was given to rival General Electric. The remaining models, airframes, and other components at their facility were destroyed by Air Force officials who brought portable smelters on big trucks to their headquarters the very next day after the grounding ruling. They asked the team members to take the last 20 years of hard work and personally destroyed it in front of them. The end of this program devastated Jack, and he would retire from the aviation industry soon after, never realizing his dream of a more superior way to fly. In the end, the failure of this program is obvious in hindsight. The program was heavily delayed, used obsolete piston engine technology, and was over budget. There were also too many experimental branches, and development was spread too thinly away from the core product. The military, seeking a solution to the Soviet problem, needed a bomber now, and the Convair B-36 was more of a conservative design despite being on paper more expensive and less efficient. The generals decided it would be better to just throw more money at a more realizable idea than bet the house on something more experimental. Like all major projects, there is also the fact that you need a little elbow grease in Washington to get it across the line, something that rival Convair was able to do far more effectively than the highly Wild West Jack Northrop. Now, like all the times I do this, I want to warn viewers that this next part is totally unproven and it's time to get your tinfoil hats out, because we're going to discuss conspiracies. According to Jack Northrop, the flying wing was cancelled by the Air Force because they wanted him to merge his company with Convair, the builders of the B-36. Apparently in an interview, he claimed the merger demands were grossly unfair to Northrop, and in retribution, the Air Force Secretary Stuart Symington killed the program perhaps through spying or industrial espionage or withholding critical design technology that the Air Force had in abundance, the program did actually spiral out of control and end up having all these problems. And that he wanted us, without question, to merge with Consolidated Voltee, which was then operating a government-owned plant in Fort Worth, building the B-36. Robbing the world of this incredible flying wing design. What are the alternatives to this demand you are making of our merger with Consolidated Voltee? He said, alternatives? You'll be goddamn sorry if you don't. Oh, and on a completely unrelated side note, that Air Force Secretary Stuart Symington actually left the Air Force a few years later and then landed a job as the president of Convair. What a happy, lucky coincidence. Of course, everything that I've just said has been looked into by various different journalists. And in fact, an investigation into this whole project, including interviews with the Secretary of the Air Force himself, paints a slightly more reasonable picture. Basically, after looking at the project and the financials of the time, there wasn't enough work to go around for all these plane makers. That it was incredibly clear that the North Rope project wasn't going to be selected, and in order to save as many jobs as possible, the Air Force suggested that these two firms merge. But let me know down in the comments what you think. Who is really to blame here? As for Northrop, they would not walk away empty-handed. They would end up winning a consolidation contract for the conventional F-89 Scorpion jet interceptor, which would then go on to have quite the exciting career with over 1,500 built. And that flying wing design? Well, it would be invaluable to create the impressive B-2 stealth bomber, which truly deserves its own video. 
In a final note, in 1980, a now aged and wheelchair-bound Jack Northrope was taken to the top secret science studio and shown the underdevelopment prototype of the B-2 bomber. He recognized the same lines and the same wingspan of the flying wing he had championed nearly 40 years earlier and said, I know why God has kept me alive for the last 25 years. He would pass 10 months later. If you love this video, I suggest you check out my companion piece about the Lockheed VTOL aircraft that they tried to build in the 1950s. Or if you haven't seen it yet, consider checking out the Convair Fish, a crazy supersonic spy plane that was designed to be better than the Lockheed SR-71. This video ended up being way longer and way more interesting than I ever dreamed, and I'm really surprised how crazy the story ended up going. Like you guys, I actually discover these stories as I write them, and I could not wait to get this to you. So I actually first tracked this project over some of the other ones that I'm currently working on. If you want to see behind the scenes work and see how I actually make these videos, then I suggest you jump onto the Discord that I've got linked down in the description. It's like a live chat sort of form where you can meet other people who love the channel and can talk about the latest videos that come out and other secret projects that I'm working on. Also, if you'd like to see the videos early or perhaps suggest future topics, then I suggest that you join our Patreon. I couldn't have done this project without their help and to them, I want to say thank you. As for the rest of you guys, I hope you subscribe and that you catch me in a few more days for the next episode of Found and Explained. In the post-war glow of the late 1940s, Pan Am shocked the world with news that it had placed an order for a truly insane aircraft. Taller than a five-story building and with six propeller engines, it could carry unimaginable amounts of people in first-class luxury across two decks from both edges of the Atlantic Ocean. But this early jumbo airline would never actually make it off the production line and its prototype would end up lost in the desert. This is the story of the never-built Convair Model 37. After the end of World War II, the US military understood the need for rapid troop transportation around the world and that aircraft provided the ideal solution over ships. Thus, they contracted Convair to design a heavy cargo aircraft that would go on to become the world's largest piston engine transport ever built. Convair started with its other large aircraft at the time, the B-36 Pacemaker, and took its wings and control services for this new version dubbed the XC-99. It would have a capacity to transport 400 fully equipped troops across the Atlantic at a moment's notice or deliver aid to Europe, especially for those cities isolated by hostile forces. Incredibly, Convair managed to build a service prototype that took to the skies in 1947 and would operate for the US Air Force as an essential cargo lift in the Korean War, setting several records in cargo capacity and flight times as it did so, putting the design and its team on the map. But the engineers who came up with the XC-99 had much grander plans than a simple military transport. They knew that they had a moment to change the future of air travel forever. This is what they came up with. The Convair Model 37 was a gigantic plane. It had a length of 182 feet or 55.63 meters and a wingspan of 230 feet across, roughly 70 meters, which is one meter shorter than the folding wingspan of the now current Boeing 777X. It was tall too, coming in at 57 feet or 17.5 meters. 
with its five cockpit crew and five relief crew members, for a total of 10 on the flight deck, it would be able to transport 400 troops in a military configuration, 100,000 pounds or 45,000 kilograms of cargo if a cargo carrier, or 204 passengers in the very best luxury of the era. If economy class had been invented back then, then we could propose that it could have carried 400 to 500 passengers per flight, around about the same of the Airbus A380, which would have been low-key incredible for the era. It was powered by six Pratt & Whitney R436041 WASP Major 28-cylinder air-cooled radial pistol engines that could push out 3,500 horsepower or 2,600 kilowatts each. With a fuel capacity of 19,000 US gallons or 72,000 liters, it could fly a total range of 4,200 miles or 6,800 kilometers with a full load of 10,000 pounds putting it well within the reach of European cities with a single refueling stop. It did, however, only fly at a maximum speed of 307 miles per hour, 494 kilometers per hour, which is just over half the speed of modern jetliners today. So clearly, it would have taken a while for passengers to make that transatlantic hop Launching this design to much fanfare, 15 orders were quickly snapped up by then airline juggernaut Pan Am, who sought to use this beast of an aircraft to link Europe and North America. They claimed that 11 of these aircraft would be able to transport 440,000 passengers per year between London and New York. It advertised that the trip would only take nine hours and that it would boast several lounges and full bathrooms across two decks. Fancy. So if this aircraft was going to bring a new age of luxury transatlantic travel to the masses, why was it never built? There are several reasons why the Model 37 never graced our skies and didn't become the backbone of airline operations. Let's talk about those engines. The truth is, is that they were deemed far too insufficient for the task at hand of powering this enormous aircraft. The intended power plant of the Model 37 was a 5,000 horsepower gas turbine engine, which failed to materialize by the time the builders got to work. The fuel and oil consumption of the current 3,500 horsepower R4360 radial engines made the design unprofitable and thus unattractive for airlines to order it, leading to Pan Am to be the sole customer. Also, there was a general feeling at the time that the plane was simply too big. 204 passengers flying on one aircraft? There would be fewer than 150 passengers waiting to fly to London to New York at any one time, surely. Of course, we know that today for aircraft, it's more of a build it and they will come mentality, and there aren't enough seats at all for many passengers to fly at least before COVID. But back then it was considered really much less of a realistic option to have such a large aircraft in your fleet. We can only imagine that had better engine technology been available at the time, and more imagination, that this aircraft would have changed the 1950s. This aircraft design would have likely been utilized extensively by the likes of Pan Am, BOAC, and Qantas Empire Airways, zipping across the world and bringing air travel to the masses far before the likes of the Boeing 747. Likely the issue of the refueling stop would have been solved and direct passenger transatlantic journeys would have been possible. Into the jet age, likely it would have become a cargo carrier and eventually used for special operations like firefighting, where its huge capacity and slower speed would have made it ideal for creating vast fire breaks. But its future today, just like the single prototype ordered by the US Air Force, retired in 1957, would be to rust away in the middle of the sunny Mojave Desert. 
The military determined that it had no need for such a large, long-range transport at the time, and the arrival of the jet engine only a few short years later made the idea of a six-engine monster plane quite preposterous. You can find the original XC-99 cut up to pieces in a boneyard at Davies Mothan outside of Tucson awaiting plans to preserve it in a museum. But such a huge fuselage is hard to keep together, and like many other never-built projects, it has now been put to rest, only to dream of a future that never was. Rising over the battlefield is a new type of tank. It's so unique that even the word tank might no longer apply. It's a new type of terrifying armored machine. With six guns and no weak armor points, it's pretty invincible. And the best part is, it hops. Wait, hold on. Sorry, everyone. Uh, what do you mean it hops? Can we just pause this for a second? Yes, you're thinking, Nick, you finally lost the plot there at Found It Explained, too much jet fuel. But no, this is a real concept from a real engineer that was actually proposed. And I know it's going to make you lose your minds. So before you write in the comments, fake news, let's deep dive into the insanity that is the floating pillbox, the hopping tank. Nothing gets bullets flying and wallets opening than a good old world war, and the second edition was no exception. Billions of hard-earned US currency was spent inventing all sorts of new ways of killing people, from machines to guns to planes and even flying hoverbikes. But it's not just the big corporations getting in on the action, but also individual citizens. Enter our hero of the story, Henry Wallace. Now, honestly, we don't know a ton about this madman, but we do know that he was from Freeport, New York, and had only submitted one other patent before this one. One for a pen that could wrap around the wrist, which actually would be pretty useful. But it's the second patent that gets a video made about it, the hopping tank. The floating pillbox, or the hopping tank, would instantly eliminate the two previous flaws of tracked tanks. First, there would be no front. Armor would be split equally around, and there would be no weak points. There would also be six cannons arranged around a circle at 45 degrees, each able to separately aim and fire at various targets. This would make the tank the ultimate defensive platform able to sit at a location, such as a crossroads, and ensure that the enemy pause their advance. In the middle, there would be a power driver, an unnamed diesel engine, and a gyroscopic stabilization device located around the center of gravity consisting of two oppositional gyroscopes. For balance, of course, but we'll get to that in a second. On top, there would be a commander position who would drive the tank forward. This little compartment could rotate separately, useful if the motion was in one direction or if it needed to scout the battlefield for firing solutions. The patent doesn't exactly break down how many crew would be required, but with a loader and gunner for each weapon and the driver themselves, you'd be looking at 8 to 13 crew at least. But I hear what you're thinking. It's only useful if this thing can move, and we have to talk about its singular leg. As mentioned, Wallace hated how tanks could only move in one direction without turning, and thought why not make essentially a queen chess piece in real life? Using its one leg, the tank would hop around in any direction whilst firing its cannons. It could retreat, advance, or flank enemy positions at a moment's notice. Plus, it could leap over rivers, buildings, and enemy fortifications with ease. Kind of. Let's actually talk about how this would work in real life. Now, this tank, air quotes, was designed around the idea of fixing the flaws of existing armoured vehicles. For one, the direction of movement of a traditional tank is limited by the track's direction. A tank can't move sideways. In addition, a tank has more armor on the front, with the rear being a weak point. Combining these points and you realize that a tank needs to expose its, again air quotes, 
soft underbelly every time it moves. Plus, a tank can only fire in one direction, or turning its turret to face a singular threat. So now you have to split the armor protection with both the front and the turret, costing you valuable weight. Now at first this design looks like a one-legged tank, but it's not actually possible to move around without hopping, something that you need a second foot for. This is where the design gets rather brilliant. The tank itself was actually the second foot. To move in any direction, the leg would slowly move out horizontally onto the tank and then extend upwards, lifting the tank back over its center, collapsing in the process. The tank would essentially move more like a slug than a pogo stick. But don't be disappointed as this was just the first version, with additional paint and drawings showing an actual leaping motion if enough force was applied, so you bet that the second version was going to hop around like a kangaroo. There would be four wheels around the central leg that would allow this version to move in any direction, and when it came to extend, it would not be hydraulic, but the leg would actually use explosive expansion of gas to shoot out. Fuel would be injected into the top of the hollow leg and then detonated, rapidly expanding the leg down and lifting the tank up. A huge advantage of this was that the tank was impossible to dislodge and the leg never extended enough to reveal its direction and was protected by the armor. But it also would have been rather slow around walking speed, but in the middle of a battlefield it would be incredibly intimidating to the enemy. But come on guys, you're watching this and you know that I'm just ready to dive into the flaws, and boy, there are a lot of them. Okay, straight up everyone watching, it's a dumb idea, I get that, but we need to pretend that we're actually the US military and give this some serious concrete reasons why it wouldn't work. First of all, the poor crew. Can you imagine riding on an explosive pogo stick? Imagine when it slammed down on the ground every 10 seconds. Even if it didn't leap around like a pogo stick, the vibrations alone would make someone sick in minutes. Plus, this tank would have had the same practicalities as a lawn dart. By having a single leg being the point of impact with the ground, the heavy weight wouldn't lift up the body, rather the leg would be driven down into the ground. That's why tanks have such a large surface area with the treads. If this leg sank into the ground with explosive force, then the whole thing could tip sideways. And yes, tipping over was a problem with this design, which is another obvious flaw. If this tank was on anything but a hard, flat surface, it could easily fall sideways and roll away. Now the patent does mention that the leg did have a small joint, meaning that it could handle angles up to a surface of 10 degrees, but anything more than that and it would tip over. And I'm not even mentioning what happens if it's windy or it's muddy, slippery ground. But wait, there's more. We also need to talk about the armor. The design of the single leg was actually more restricted with weight than a normal tank, and its armor design would only stand up to light arms fire. If a rocket, or god forbid a real tank as God intended fired upon it, it would go up like a candle. The guns arranged around the center of the tank were also more of a flaw than an advantage. At best, only two guns could fire onto an enemy to the front, meaning two thirds were useless, and the tank had no real quick way to rotate on the spot, barely able to track targets. There was also a blind spot in between each of the small cannons. This would have been solved with a simple rotating turret, just like on a real tank. At the end of the day, Tanks Encyclopedia, used as a source for this video today, summed it up perfectly. Weakly protected for a static pillbox, poorly protected for such a visible tank, and oddly armored for a fighting vehicle, this design was particularly bad when it came to motion. This was the least practical design for a tank ever made, but Wallace wins the award for imagination. I kind of wish that they could have recruited him to see what else he would have come up with, because this guy was truly nuts. What do you think? Let me know down in the comments.